Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, d'un mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un mon jardin d'hiver. So, Congressman, um, many Democrats, including Democratic leaders, uh, Pelosi and Schiff, to name two, said before this was released that its release would jeopardize American national security. That turned out to be a lie, provably, because there's nothing in this that was classified. In fact, there's it's no obvious reason it was classified in the first place. So why would they tell us that when they knew it wasn't true? Good evening, Tucker. Uh, you should be concerned about this, too. It does reveal sources. You should read uh, the memo. Just because you knew the sources beforehand because they were reported on doesn't mean we acknowledge them in ongoing investigations. So please, be precise, about how, here, though, please be precise about how it jeopardizes our national security because a lot of us are concerned about doing that. And I would never want to play any role in doing that. And that's why it's such a serious charge. And that's why well, we make it. You're playing a role in doing that right now. By, well, tell me how. You're playing a role. Because we don't acknowledge sources in ongoing investigations. What source are you FISA talking about, and, and how does that imperil well, our country? Well, the, the, me, the memo goes into Papadopoulos and Page and others that you only knew about because they were reported on, not because well, they I were I knew about but because Papadopoulos say, Tucker, was indicted, the larger, and the memo came but, out today. So just explain to me how you just accused yeah. me of endangering American national security, and I think it's fair to ask you to be very precise in explaining how I'm doing that. So please do. The, the larger danger that, that no, you're no, no, doing and, not and the others larger are doing danger. is you just the, the rule of law. Per, Tucker, oh, slow down. You're you using just the police oh, so, no, I'm not to go let you after go your political enemies. I'm not going to let you go. Yeah. You just I, I so you, you got two. You got two choices. You can either apologize and take it back, or you can explain <laughs> it. I think it's fair to ask you to I, explain, I explain what you Tucker. meant when you said I was. Yeah. How? How does that jeopardize our country's security? Because we don't reveal the sources in ongoing investigations. Tucker, right now in every so police now that station this in has America, been revealed, the police, how are Tucker, we let me finish. Danger? Let me okay. finish, Tucker. In every police station in America, the police are interviewing a suspect. And you're suggesting that we should give the suspect the evidence before we ask them the questions. Who's but the this suspect? Is about the rule I'm honestly, of law. Can, what We're the trampling hell are you over the rule about? of law in this country. But what, they gave what, the White House evidence in the Russia okay. investigation. The I'm White House the are White subjects House. of the, I'm talking of about the Russian... Me, hold on. I'm talking about me as an American citizen who yeah. got a chance to read this much-talked-about memo today, and I listened to people like you tell me, and now explicitly tell me, that I'm hurting our country by reading it. And I want to know how and you're I'm also hurting that. our country by not acknowledging the rule of law has been run over. They're using the police okay. to attack their one, enemies. I'm sorry. Attacking the one death penalty offense at a time here. One, okay. one serious <laughs> crime at a time. So I don't I understand. Like you, Tucker, you don't but have I think an you're answer, which is one. why you're not answering yeah. my question. But I, I would gave suggest you a bunch of answers, not Tucker. make it. No, yeah. I, I have literally you don't no like idea the what answer. You're That's the problem. Then why do you, you don't try like this the one? answer? We know from this yeah. that Carter Page four times was described by the Department of Justice, by the FBI, as an agent of a foreign power, Russia. Four times. So the question to and you in 2013 is, as well. Do, he was not accused of that in 2013. He was no, surveilled. actually, he we acknowledged have, we to our committee. You should read his testimony. Unless you're revealing something our... that has not been revealed before. But I'm revealing you this... something you should have read, which was his testimony to our committee, where he acknowledged he was person A in the indictment in 2013, I... where he okay. was suspected of being a Russian foreign agent. Oh, but I don't, think he, I don't think he was accused of it. Let me ask you this, though. Do you think he was? He was? Do you think? It. Okay, fine. Do you think, since the DOJ accused him of that before a FISA court, do you believe it? Is he a foreign agent? Simple question. What do you think? He, he was under suspicion. It's an ongoing investigation that's not closed. That's the problem, Tucker. But it's do you still think open, he is a, no, but and you, you, think, want, uh, you want us to... Do you to think he's a foreign agent? ...to comment agent? on it. It's open. 
It's no, still an open investigation. Well, I think you're, I think you're entitled to your opinion under the Constitution. In real time. If you're going to impugn the man's character, as you relentlessly have, suggesting that he's betraying his country, committing treason, I think it's fair to ask you, man to man, an honest question, a straightforward one with no innuendo, do you think he's betraying his country? I think you're not allowing the FBI to answer that question with what you and others are doing to undermine the work. You've got to be work. kidding. I, all I want no, is for my questions to be answered. I sit here, an open, willing repository for all information, including your memo, including the documents that supported this memo, including the so testimony So you support our memo coming committee. out? I want to be clear. Of course I do. Are do you, you support kidding? our memo coming out? Of course I do. Out? Absolutely I okay. do. I support we should talk all about information it next week. that gets to the truth. Invite me back. What I don't support, I'll be in is, making, what I don't support is making reckless mm -hmm. allegations about other Americans that you cannot support, as when you said I was harming our country's national security, and as when you suggested Carter Page was betraying this nation. And I want to know... You're peddling you, a narrative that I'm undermines the I'm not peddling a narrative. I'm asking a question. You just said on my air, on my show, you're imperiling our national security. I said, oh, really, Congressman? How am I doing that? Am I going to be arrested for that? Because, I don't know, it seems like the kind of thing a man could be arrested for. Yeah, th these are important times in our history. Either you are I've supporting noticed. those that are undermining the independence of the Department of Justice and the rule of law, or you're standing firm and saying this is wrong. Tucker, I wish you were on my side because I think you know better. I'm not sure what the hell you're talking about. I only wish I think that you don't you like what I'm talking about. Si oh, well, I definitely don't like what you're talking about, but more profoundly, I don't understand it. And when you accuse someone you read of committing a crime for which people are arrested, why don't you game it out for me? Tell me one thing that I have said that you think makes all Americans, including my children, less safe. You continue to support the idea that we should give suspects in criminal cases the evidence against them before we ask them any questions. Well, you I, also I, believe I, that I there's nothing wrong I don't support that. I do think we should give them the benefit of the doubt as the, the Constitution requires us to. You. Call me a liberal. When have I said that I think that we should give evidence to... I'm not even sure what that means. I, by the way, I think people charged in a, in a criminal case have the right to the evidence against them, do don't you, they? Do you think... What? Wait, wait, well, so not when they're being, are you aware not of that? when they're Don't... being questioned, Tucker. Yeah, Tucker, not when they're being questioned, not when they're under suspicion. Do you think it's a problem so that the White House was sent I evidence in the Russia investigation? Okay. Do you think it's a problem that they were sent evidence in the Russia investigation when they are subjects of the investigation? Who's they? You don't see a conflict there? What in the what? No, no, Donald I, Trump I, and maybe Don, I would. Don but in this in the case of today's memo, what specifically have I espoused that empowers threats to our country. You're, you're peddling the narrative that the Trump administration is putting out, which also is the Putin narrative because they're retweeting this with their Russian bots. This, if you're so on the I'm same side as WikiLeaks Putin too. and Putin, I wonder, do you perceive if you're on the, the same side as WikiLeaks and Putin, you should take uh, a step back and wonder whose bidding are you really doing? It is Tuesday. February 6th of 2018, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. It is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays here at the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. In fact, back in the chef's table, it will be Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays also. We are just a, a cornucopia of abundance ever since uh, this, uh, what, the orange... Gaboon has taken uh, office as president. Uh, yeah, I there's. <laughs> I loved how the confluence of uh, events, the synchronicity of the universe, can come and you know bite somebody in the rear if they're not too careful. What is it that uh, they say? If you uh, if you uh, you know live by the stock market, you may you may die by the stock market, and it was quite hilarious. I believe it was Ohio. Trump was in Ohio touting his tax cuts and how great the economy is doing, just as the uh, Dow crashed in the largest one-day slide in the history of the market. I know the stock market isn't supposed to be an indicator of the economy. I know the president doesn't really have any impact on the stock market but i gotta tell you if uh if uh, you gotta take a one trillion dollar loan uh, that might that might impact the stock markets a little bit yes yes that's essentially not essentially it is what trump and his administration are doing one year in office running the economy 
and he's got to take a $1 trillion loan already. He said he was going to run government like a business, and his businesses have, have tended to lose money. He goes bankrupt. He sues people so he doesn't have to pay what he owes them. And uh, he ends up uh, uh, burning all of his bridges by not paying back banks who have given him loans that he has to, you know, I take a, he's got to take a, a bit of a, a contract with Russian mobsters. I wonder what the interest is on that. Hmm. But I don't want to put on the tinfoil hat too much because you already got this guy who calls himself the president of the United States whining because, oh, the Democrats didn't applaud me. They're the ones that are treasonous, not me. They're treasonous. You don't applaud the so-called leader of the free world. You're a traitor. But, uh, you know, oh, Russian mobster is a bunch of money to the tune that you're handing over America to them. No, no, that's not treason at all. That's just, it's not personal. It's business. We've all seen the movie. It's just that, you know, is Trump sunny? I don't even think that Trump is smart enough to be sunny. Because at least sunny was tough. Can you imagine Trump actually getting in a fist fight with those soft little hands? I bet he I bet he soaks them. He soaks his cuticles. You know it. Oh boy. Well, let me um I I I'm just going on. That was a quite long clip, but I wanted to say Tucker Carlson Carlson is a loathsome creature, loathsome. And uh, I just loved how he clipped Swalwell there at the end. Could he even, you know, let him finish the last consonant in the sentence? Couldn't. And uh, that wasn't me. That's that was how it was. And uh, yeah, I suppose with Tucker Carlson, if you forged your moral code by uh, being the heir to the Swanson TV dinner fortune. And then you you go on the most, con well, I wouldn't say conservative, but you go on Trump TV, what is now Trump TV, and and uh, pontificate about the destruction of America as we know it. Well, the TV dinner had a lot to do with that. Okay, buddy, you know, own up to it. At least, at least the Rockefeller kids, you know, felt a little bit of noblesse oblige. Oh, boy. Okay, well, these are the issues we are attending to today. Of course, that was Eric Swalwell ruining uh, Tucker Host's uh, efforts to smear the left as hysterical over the release of the Nunez memo. Mm -hmm. Nunez is going to issue five more. First one doesn't work. He's got some more to throw up against the wall. Let's see if that sticks. And uh, little Adam Schiff. Let me remind folks about Adam Schiff, okay, if we might. Who is Adam Schiff? Well, at, when Adam Schiff was a U.S. An assistant U.S. attorney. He prosecuted and convicted Richard Miller. And you don't remember him? Well, he was the first FBI agent to be indicted for espionage. And, and who was Miller working for? <laughs> yeah, the then Soviet Union. So uh, no wonder, no wonder he's now little Adam Schiff. Trump just found out about that, and uh, he's, he's, he's going to be scared. And he is, and he ought to be. Okay, on the rest of the menu, senators urged the Trump administration to resume the Equifax data breach probe. Yeah, Mulvaney said, nah, we're not going to. Equifax uh, released uh, the information of every single American who, who has a credit report. Well, it's already out there. No need to probe it now. Unbelievable. The Pentagon cannot account for several hundreds of millions of dollars it spent. And a CNN employee found the DHS Super Bowl security reports tucked inside the back pocket of an airplane seat before the game. And they didn't release it before, you know, would have uh, breached uh, the security measures that uh, DHS had in place. Well, you know. Nothing but the best and the brightest running uh, this administration. After the break, we'll move to the chef's table where Seattle says Facebook is violating its city campaign finance law. And because the demise of coal in Appalachia is leaving education in the lurch, clean energy 
and other industries are unlikely to move into those former coal mining areas. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. get on with this first article here. In the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, it is out of Reuters. Uh, Patrick Rucker is doing the reporting here. Now, Democratic senators and consumer advocates yesterday urged the Trump administration to resume an, administ- an investigation into how Equifax failed to protect the personal data of millions of consumers after Reuters reported that the head of the U.S. Consumer Watchdog has pulled back on the existing probe. We're looking at you, Mulvaney. Now, of course, remember, hackers had stolen personal data collected on some 143 million Americans and counting. Reuters reported yesterday that Mick Mulvaney, head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, has dialed back the investigation begun by his predecessor, Richard Cordray. Specifically, Mulvaney is held back from ordering subpoenas against Equifax, a routine step in launching a full-scale probe. Meanwhile, the CFPB has shelled plans for on-the-ground tests of how Equifax protects data, an idea that was backed by Cordray. Well, of course, anything they wanted, you can't have. You can't do. Okay. Uh, Well... Mark Warner, Senator Mark Warner, said the administration should get on the side of consumers and focus on making sure hacks like the Equifax breach do not happen again. Of course, we all know Mulvaney is leading the CFPB on a temporary basis so he can dismantle it. And, you know, you put somebody else in there that's not as uh, uh, administratively competent to destroy things in an orderly fashion. So he'll put the dominoes in effect. They'll be falling, and then they'll put somebody in there, and, you know, that's how they work it. Okay, well, we were all victimized, or at least they say half of us, because the other half are too young to even have a Social Security number because they're angel babies. the good old days when the Pentagon overspent on a toilet seat and that made the headlines and it was the most corrupt thing that anyone could imagine. How can they charge you $800,000 for a screw? I mean, how is that possible? Well, I'll tell you how it's possible. Uh, when When you're machining these high stress and tolerance uh, threads you have to have a particular kind of metal you have to be able to turn the lathe at a precise revolution and uh, then it gets to the middlemen and that's where the price jacks up yeah and uh, everybody's got to get paid everybody's got to get paid so uh, while I'm roaming around uh, the world looking for news because I can't report just on, you know, the latest Trump thing. I Because everybody does it, and they do it much better than I do. All right. So uh, I found this, and it, it, it just seemed like it harkened back to a ro- more romantic and, uh, I don't know, tranquil time in comparison. Isn't it weird? Well, it looks like, uh, once again, and this is an old story. 
the Pentagon not being able to account for hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe a billion or more. We This is what we know of. Well, one of the Pentagon's leading agencies can't seem to account for about a billion bucks alone. And uh, so let's remember, Trump did sign a $700 billion defense bill into law, supposedly to ramp up the size and strength of the U.S. military. That's not quite where what it does. It's just, uh, you know, it's a pass-through. It's a pass-through to put money in other people's pockets, okay? Oh, yeah, I know they're calling it $800,000 screws. But really, let's be clear. It's like it's like buying, uh, you know, uh, uh, an estate near Mar-a-Lago for three times its sale price. And then turning around and selling it for a loss I or, or something. It's a pass-through. According to our new report from Politico, the Defense Logistics Agency, of course it would be there, has failed to produce documentation for over $800 million worth of construction projects. And that's just what, what we know of. Uh, the, uh, and that's from uh, the accounting firm Ernst & Young. Yeah. Little side note. I was a... I was a man Friday. I think that's what you would call it. A butler is what they called me in uh, the uh, upper floors at Ernst Young in San Francisco. I was there to be a butler. Yeah. You know, coffee, make sure the table's set. They had like, I got to tell you, really cheap baked baked goods. They could have done a little bit better on the baked goods. Yee. Okay, so... uh, Given the enormity, one might assume uh, the DLA would be subject to strict oversight. In fact, just the opposite is true. Not only are the financial records for the agency incomplete, but the Department of Defense itself has never undergone a full audit, despite commanding as much as $2.2 trillion in assets. Well, that's a national security issue. If you audit the military and the whole of the Defense Department, then our enemies might find out uh, our secrets. So, and why go through all that trouble when all they have to do is go to the Oval Office and uh, Don will give it to him personally? I mean, come on. This is just for efficiency's sake, and I understand it. The Pentagon's own internal analysis uh, says that the Defense Department blew as much as $125 billion on administrative waste in just 2015, a report that it buried for fear Congress might slash its budget. Well, yeah. God, kids, we told you not to eat up all the bread before the end of the month. Now you'll have to be corrected. Sensitive government information might fall into the wrong hands. Like, like if you had an, a, a server, some kind of like computer server in, in the dark confines of your basement, it's not even hooked up to anything. But there is a danger that someone might be able to hack into it with uh, the, the mind meld, uh, the Spockian splayed finger posture from afar. Maybe a Tesla Spockian mind meld. It could happen. And if one doesn't take care to, to protect that data, to protect that sensitive information, they should be made to suffer, especially if it's a woman. And if it's a woman who is responsible for this, then I'm sure that she should be made to not only suffer, but 
be made to be persecuted over and over and over again when all evidence of the contrary is proved or innocence and that all of it is just an overblown conspiracy. So when I come across stories like this, they're going to say, yeah, it's just one of those things. Okay, well, CNN. You know, when you're in a war, maybe sometimes you don't want to report about troop movements until after the troops have moved. And the uh, mission is done, and then you can report on it. Because if you give it in real time, it might be, uh, you know, what, what do they call it? Yeah, divulging sensitive information to maybe people who uh, uh, shouldn't have it yet. So uh, CNN actually uh, comes out, I have to say, to be somewhat of a hero in this. Or... Uh, the fake media, CNN, because they're fake news, you know. We get, we hear that from uh, uh, Huckabee Sanders and that guy Donald Trump all the time. They cover DHS's posterior areas. This is by Greg Price out of Newsweek, reporting on CNN being a hero in this. Sensitive anti-terrorism documents detailing and, and criticizing responses to a hypothetical anthrax attack at the Super Bowl were reportedly discovered on a commercial airplane despite orders to keep them under lock and key and destroy them after use. This is like Mission Impossible. The Department of Homeland Security reports were labeled for official use only and important for national security. The reports described exercises officials in Minneapolis could use to respond to a possible biological weapon attack during this during Sunday's game, according to CNN. Man, they should have put me into this hypothetical scenario. I would have said, "Let's do it with the with the Goodyear blimp. Let's bring the anthrax in on the Goodyear blimp." Okay. Uh. Unfortunately, I think that was an enclosed uh, structure, so you probably couldn't get the Goodyear blimp in there. But with digital cinema these days, you can make it look like uh, the Coliseum in, in Los Angeles. Jeez. Okay. The CNN employee found the documents tucked inside the back pocket of an airplane seat, but the network decided not to publish its story until after the game. When officials warned a release could hurt existing security measures, they did their due diligence. They called up and said, what do you have to say about uh, the sensitive uh, security documents being found and tucked in the uh, uh, seat on an airplane seat? You know, where you have the the uh, the instructions on how to exit the plane in, cl in case of a water landing and maybe maybe a few magazines, you know, airline magazines fly fishing in Montana. You get to read about that. And then then security measures. Well, uh, the exercise was a resounding success and was not conducted in response to any specific credible threat of a bioterrorism attack. A DHS, DHS spokesperson said, yeah, well, you know, fake news didn't report the real news, apparently. The report did explain that some local law enforcement and emergency management agencies possess only a cursory knowledge of the BioWatch program and its mission because they're too busy trying to take people's property while they're still can under the Sessions regime. That's going to stop real soon when Sessions and the rest of his crew get kicked out. All right, still the incident could be viewed as a black eye on DHS, do you think? The biggest consequence of this mistake may have less to do with terrorists knowing our vulnerabilities and more to do with confidence in the Department of Homeland Security. Well, yeah, look what's happened to the FBI. And they were just doing their job trying to protect us from being overtaken by a hostile enemy. Jeez. The loss or misplacement of government files has recently affected other countries as well. Yeah, King United K, uh, the UK's National Archives lost nearly 1,000 files detailing matters as sensitive as the war in the Falklands. That's sensitive? Yeah. You go down there and see what they still think about it. 
Also issues over Northern Ireland. They think the Falklands are more sensitive than what's happened in Northern Ireland. Well, that's priorities. Okay, and um, Australian Broadcasting managed to get a hold of thousands of classified documents locked inside two filing cabinets that detailed government work for almost 10 years. All right, let's get to our uh, break, and we'll come back, go through the weather, and finish up with the rest of the stories at the chef's table. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. Killer whales, also called orcas, are like dolphins and belugas. They all have a wide vocal repertoire. But orcas also have unique dialects among different pods, which suggests the animals can learn new and unique sounds by imitating mom or another whale. Researchers tested that premise by asking a killer whale named Wiki to imitate novel sounds from another killer whale, like this. Or this. And then Wiki's trainers asked her to imitate them, speaking English. Here's how she did. Pretty impressive, especially because she's using her nasal passages to imitate sounds we make with our vocal cords. And a technical acoustic analysis of the original and imitated sounds showed that Wiki was doing a reliable job of mimicry, suggesting orcas do indeed possess the ability of vocal imitation. The study is in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B. So how long before Wiki's speaking fluent English? Well, this is not our goal. Study author Jose Zamorano Abramson, a comparative psychologist. We are focusing on one aspect of vocal language, which is the capacity for vocal imitation. Because the ability to imitate implies a way to transmit culture. And in doing so, preserve each orcopod's unique repertoire. Bye bye. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Christopher Intagliata. This is 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. In certain cases, government can limit the way you practice your religious beliefs. The U.S. Supreme Court has ruled that certain religious practices may be forbidden without violating constitutional rights. The court has said that religious practices may be limited if they are contrary to public morals, endanger health, or harm the common good. U.S. Supreme Court decisions have said that religious practices involving polygamy may be forbidden. Government can also require that children be vaccinated against certain contagious diseases before being admitted to public school. They may require vaccination even if it violates a family's religious beliefs. That's all for today's podcast. 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. Is the National Security Agency still engaging in mass warrantless spying on Americans? My name is Ramsey Clark, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute with ACLU attorney Bill Newman. Unfortunately, the answer is yes. And now the answer gets worse because Congress has just renewed and passed a law that permits the government's warrantless spying on Americans to continue unabated. The vote in late January concerns Section 702 of FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Section 702 of FISA is the law, as disclosed by Edward Snowden, that the NSA uses to spy not on foreign intelligence operatives, but on Americans contrary to the spirit and purpose of the law, which was due to expire. But instead of reforming the law and restricting the NSA, Congress reauthorized it. Nonetheless, there is some hope. Many Democrats and Republicans oppose Section 702, 
and the ACLU is challenging the provision in court. And courts in Europe may find that the U.S. government's surveillance practices violate agreements with the EU that would, as a practical matter, for business and trade reasons, require reform of Section 702. The bottom line, no one said surveillance reform was going to be easy, but the fight goes on. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. This is a Radio Labor special report recorded on Monday, February 5th, 2018. I'm Mark Belanger. The international labor movement is growing increasingly worried about the power of digital corporations such as Amazon, Google, and Facebook. Unions are concerned that these corporations concentrate so much power and control onto themselves that they represent a threat not only to our economies, but also democratic societies. Just recently at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, labor leaders tried to warn the participants about the monopoly practices of the digital platform companies. One of those labor leaders was Philip Jennings, the General Secretary of Uni Global Union. Uni represents some 20 million workers who are members of 900 unions around the world. They work in the skills and services sectors. Mr. Jennings was asked about the growing problem of digital monopolies. What can I say? Monopoly is back. We have more wealth, concentration of wealth, in not just in the high-tech sector, but throughout the economy. This is no accident. We have let this happen. In the realm of big tech, you're all aware of the figures that 46% of online sales uh, are attributed to Amazon, 90% plus of all the search activity of Google. And with Facebook, we're heading towards a Facebook planet of 3 billion people online. We should also look at retail. We should look at the finance sector. Remember 10 years ago when we were talking about the financial crisis, that banks were too big to fail? We saw concentration of financial power they weren't too big to fail, and they, and they failed us. I think our approach on this, when working people look at this, we look back in time, and we have to maybe look back to that time of when the plutocrats first made their apparition at the time of the Industrial Revolution. I found a quote which might help. John Sherman, as the Sherman Antitrust Act said, if we will not endure a king as political power, we should not endure a king over the production, transportation, and sale of any necessities of life. Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations said something similar. Why does this particular form of monopoly as we see it worry us? We have to think of the digital world in terms of digital conglomerates. We have a time of digital feudalism. This means the power that they have is enormous and has ripples and implications in all ways in terms of the price that people pay for a product, in terms of wages, in terms of inequality, and in terms of power. And therefore, they are concerns which, which we have dealt with in the past, but what is new about this, in this new age of digital conglomeration, it is now clear that these tools not only can direct us in terms of the products that we buy, but they begin to have an impact on the way that we think, on the way that we respond, the way that we receive and interpret the news, and all of a sudden you see an all-embracing monopolistic power, if you like, which goes beyond the material into the, the non-material of world in terms of our behavior and in terms of our attitude. Now, I can give you the nuts and bolts of what it means to us when Walmart comes to town. When Walmart comes to town, local competition is hammered. It has a depressing impact on competition, squeezes out the small and medium-sized enterprises, and has a major impact on the price of labor as well. We have seen in Silicon Valley the use of this power when their cartel on engineering salaries was bust some time ago, which apparently cost millions. The figures are clear. It cost hundreds of millions in terms of, of lost earnings. So what can I say? From where I am, I'm not a lawyer. I am not a, a competition expert, but we are worried about the new power that we have. We must talk in terms of digital capitalism, digital conglomerates, 
a kind of digital feudalism which goes beyond the material into how we interact as humans, how we, how we form opinions, how we engage with the political process, and our sense is this has gone too far. And that's it. International labor news you can use. I'm Mark Belanger. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's all about global solidarity. From United Nations headquarters in New York, this is your World in Two Minutes. I'm your host, Luke Vargas, for Talk Media News. France won't sign a free trade deal with the United States unless President Trump commits to the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Addressing the French Parliament, Secretary of State Jean-Baptiste Lemoyne said that, quote, the U.S. knows what to expect. And France is not alone in standing up to Trump's climate policies. The European Union's trade commissioner wrote on Twitter Thursday that reference to the Paris Agreement is now needed in all new European Union trade deals. A U.N. court has for the first time demanded that one country pay its neighbor for environmental damage, and it's putting a price tag on that damage. On Friday, the International Court of Justice ordered Nicaragua cough up nearly $400,000 to Costa Rica to cover damage to a wetland caused by river dredging in 2010. The court's decision to financially value environmental damage could prove a historic precedent as the court takes on future cases involving climate change. And the United States is imposing an arms embargo on South Sudan, the world's newest nation, that just years ago the U.S. aided during its independence push. The State Department said Friday the U.S. is, quote, appalled by the continuing violence in South Sudan that has created one of Africa's worst humanitarian crises. According to the United Nations, five years of civil war in South Sudan has left half of the country's population, or roughly five million people, in severe need of food assistance, while some two and a half million have fled the country altogether. Under the new U.S. sanctions, defense articles and defense services can no longer be exported to South Sudan. The U.S. is also now asking the U.N. Security Council to go further by imposing an international arms embargo on South Sudan. For more global news headlines, visit TalkMediaNews.com. Thank you for accompanying us to the chef's table here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. Yep, got a big bowl of it today. Darn right, folks. Okay, uh, we uh, will start off with our palate cleanser, which is weather from around the world. And we begin along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the West Coast of the continental United States of America. It is currently 30 degrees. When I stepped out, it felt a, a bit nippy. Yes, I had to turn up my collar. And uh, we'll, we are expecting, I love this part though, we're expecting a high of 62 to 64. So, yeah, 20 to 30 degree swings in weather from daytime temps to nighttime temps uh, through uh, the next 10 days or so. That always is a way to catch the flu, isn't it? Be careful. All right. Uh, they say that dry conditions will continue, though with humidity at 93%, it's drizzling right now where I live. Low hanging clouds. Uh, pressure is at 30.33 inches. Visibility is actually up to eight miles. And humidity, of course, is 93%. Our air quality index here is good at 33 parts per million. It to me, it smelled and felt um, uh, sweet, sweet air. I like sweet air. Sour air always sucked. Okay, now weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased, and these people live around the world. London is 39 and partly cloudy. 
Paris is 31 with snow. Oh, boy. Rome is 54 and mostly cloudy. Kiev is 24 and fair. Kabul is uh, 36 with smoke. (laughs) Yeah, they got to keep warm now. Hong Kong is 49 and clear. Tokyo is 36 and fair. Sydney, Australia, they are still experiencing summer, is 71 and partly cloudy. San Francisco, California is 60 degrees and clear. And New York, New York is 31 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that's weather from around the world, brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. And these people live around the world. I uh, did fail to mention that those of you on the East Coast may have received a tsunami warning. Uh, That was just a test. So it had been sent out and that may have caused uh, quite a few people some concern. I always figure on the East Coast, it would be a tidal wave. And then in the Pacific, you know, you have the Atlantic over there on the East Coast. And over here in the Pacific, we have the tsunami. So it would be a tidal wave warning for you. Tsunami warnings for us. Like you get hurricanes and then we got typhoons. Well, maybe not typhoons because yeah, it would be. It'd be a typhoon. So there. So don't don't worry. That that tsunami warning wasn't meant for you. And it was only a test. So as far as you know. See what they've done? Okay, uh, this next story here, since we are at the chef's table on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. This is out of Reuters by uh, David Ingram is doing the reporting on this. Seattle's election authority said yesterday that Facebook Inc. is in violation of a city law. It requires disclosure of who buys election ads, the first attempt of its kind, to regulate U.S. political ads on the Internet. Ooh, now they're talking about free speech. Notice how the authoritarian regimes and, you know, the more conservative elements who hate every aspect of change and modernity are also the most adept at making sure that every bit of protocol is used to dismantle the whole idea of having protocol to begin with. They become experts at it. Okay. Facebook must disclose details about spending in last year's city at Seattle city elections or face penalties. Wayne Barnett, executive director of the Seattle Ethics and Elections Commission, said in a statement, you know, the problem with these ethics and elections commissions, they're really like, they're, they're Interfering with business. Don't they know how many jobs could be lost in this? The penalties could be up to 5000 per advertising buy. I got to tell you, there's, I know personally, hundreds of graphic designers who got out of those uh, uh, for-profit art schools. And they were promised jobs. <sighs> yeah, so they'll be out of a job. Come on, 5000 per advertising buy is a penalty? It was not immediately clear how Facebook would respond to penalized. Cut a check, Mark. You can afford it. Facebook is a strong supporter of transparency in political advertising. <laughs> yeah. You now have people who used to work for you uh, writing up a manifesto on how to keep people from being addicted to your brainwashing. Transparency. The unregulated nature of U.S. online political ads drew attention last year after Facebook said Russians using fake names bought ads on the social network to try to sway voters ahead of the 2016 presidential election. Moscow denies trying to meddle in the election. Yeah, they do, don't they? 
And so did Facebook. No, 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 that never happened. They only let us know after it all happened. Isn't that funny? Okay. At the center of the Seattle dispute is a 1977 law that requires companies that sell election advertising, such as radio stations, to maintain public books showing the names of who bought ads, the payments, and the exact nature and extent of the advertising services rendered. The law went unenforced against tech companies until a local newspaper, The Stranger, a local independent newspaper, published a story in December in the wake of the Russia allegations asking why. Why indeed. Seattle sent later letters to Facebook and Google asking them for, to provide data. The sides have been in talks, and last month Facebook employees met in person with commissioned staff. We gave Facebook ample time to comply with the law, with the law, Barnett said. Google has asked for more time to comply, and that request is pending because they're still trying to fix, figure out the infrastructure for China in which to uh, make it so that people, you know, can't figure out what the hell is going on in the world because Alibaba says this is all you get to know. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes Quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers, c'est tout. Okay, finishing up here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terry Town Chowder Tuesdays is out of uh, Think Progress. Mark Hand is penning this reportage. Uh, this is a sad predicament. Now, as coal is slowly dying, if it isn't in its last throes already, uh... There, there's a bit of what we might call a blowback. Less people working coal, less people with jobs, less people spending, less tax revenues in the area in which to support the schools, less schools, less education, less possibility of those industries that uh, require a, a higher level of learning to be able to do the job will not be moving in there to uh, give the area the renaissance that, well, it needs, requires, certainly needs. So that's it in a nutshell. Declining coal production in many Appalachian communities is contributing to state and local governments generating less revenue to support education and other social services. And that's especially true in areas where the local economy lacks diversification you know nature teaches us monocultures don't work uh, they they're hard to maintain they they really take more energy in than what you get out if you really quantified it to sustain it you have to expend so much effort and uh, in the process destroy the environment around everything and it too the same thing happens here. If you only have one job, you know, you got a sawmill and that's it. With poor education standards and a steady trend of people moving out of rural communities, areas of Appalachia are failing to attract companies from non-coal industries, including the clean energy sector. The result will be an inability to invest the necessary state and local dollars in traditional K-12 education, creating dire consequences for students in parts of coal country. 
Education is one of the most important ingredients to regional development and individual prosperity. Yeah, we were taught education was uh, the way to social mobility. It equalized the playing field. Those who came from the aristocracy had the same uh, uh, avenues to education as those who whose dads uh, were uh, auto parts installers. Everybody had a chance for that education, and each could rise to their own abilities. Remember those grand days? Unfortunately, education attainment in the Appalachian region lags the national average. Yeah. Remember that movie? I think it was Rocket Boys. Was that it? Ed, the Appalachian kids uh, who essentially idolized Werner von Braun because of his, uh, his missiles that he was making for the then fledgling space uh, industry and exploration, and they became so enamored with it. That was in coal country. Well, coal jobs have been declining. I wonder why. Because uh, we're able to pulverize rock a few miles down. And there's gas bubbles trapped in this solidified rock. And if you pressure it and fracture it, fracking, it releases all those bubbles. And somehow... All of that natural gas is coming out of all those microscopic bubbles trapped in hard rock is making coal go away. I don't hear Trump saying, let's get rid of fracking. Yeah, let's get rid of wind turbines, though. (laughs) Solar panels? Jeez. I I came across a story, and I cannot remember what state it is, but there's, of course, some toady to uh, the fossil fuel industry that's trying to say that solar panels... And wind energy are not renewable. Okay. Now, the migration of families with school-age children out of coal country will lead to smaller school districts that require less public funding to operate. The out-migration is going to help solve this problem, but it's really a sad way for the problem to be resolved. Uh, Mark Matthew Murray, professor of economics at the Howard H. Baker Jr. Center for Public Policy at the University of Tennessee, told Think Progress. Many coal workers and their families, though, will stay in the region lured by the possible return of high-paying coal jobs they were promised. Well, Carrier was promised, too, and look what happened to them. Jeez. And they fall for it every single time. The pattern of residents moving out of counties where the coal industry was once dominant is occurring in rural areas across the nation, according to Professor Murray. What we're seeing take place in Appalachia is being aggravated by what's happening in coal, based on nationwide trends, he said. We would see this kind of pattern emerge anyway. People increasingly increasingly want to live in and near metropolitan areas. That's true in coal country, but that's true outside of coal country as well. Have you ever tried to find good Chinese in cold country? I'm telling you, you got to get to the cosmopolitan areas. And even then you're risking it. But at least it's better than what your the alternatives. <sighs> Chop suey in a can? Come on! Most industries cannot operate economically in the mountainous terrain of Appalachia. Renewable energy sources like solar and wind would require the construction of expensive high-voltage electrical transmission lines. The older demographics of the remaining population would also deter companies from moving their operations into these areas of Appalachia, according to Professor Murray, who asked, where would you find 100 people in the mix of occupations you would need to run a manufacturing facility in one of these communities? Well, you know, there is a fledgling uh, back-to-the-family-farm movement where people are getting tired of the hustle bustle of the cosmopolitan area and they're moving to that transition area between absolute wilderness and the town. Maybe we'll get that. Okay, well that does bring us to the end of our broadcast period and we will meet up tomorrow for Smothered Benedict Wednesdays here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And stay tuned to the rest of the day for some great 
uh, programming and content, and lots and lots and lots of news. And we will visit with you tomorrow in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Du frais d'Aster, revoir un latte coël. Je voudrais toujours te plaire dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je veux déjeuner par terre, comme au long de golf clair. T'embrasser les yeux ouverts dans mon jardin d'hiver. Dans mon jardin d'hiver